Okay, thank you, Nihal, uh, for the introduction. I just try to manage how to do. Oh. Sorry. This one? Oh, okay. 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 Uh, uh, thank you, Nihao, for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today, I would argue, is uh, very modest. Um, I will start off with two important uh, dimensions of planning, uh, people and planning. And then on that basis, then I will talk about you know, what, sorry, I go faster. Then we'll talk about you know, the Hong Kong case. Uh, instead of going directly uh, to the wedding car street, I will give you some indication what so, uh, I would argue, specific about Hong Kong. And then after that, and on that basis, I will tell you uh, why Hong Kong is so special. Uh, because of the way what I call the Urban Renewal Authority, URA, uh, is so important an agent of development which uh, you may not be able to find in other parts of the world. And based on this, then I will do look at the case, uh, Wedding Car Street, uh, to see how people and planning uh, actually play together in producing the results that we have observed nowadays. And then finally, I'll just give you some idea of uh, what possible ways out it can be. Now, in this country, I suppose uh, since uh, Paul Davidoff uh, put forward his choice of theory, and then after Bert uh, Einstein's letter of city, city, city citizen participation, this country has been talking about, you know, community planning as a way to try to produce good results in planning. Now, having said that, you know, we know that, you know, there would be a least of, you know, advantages of such exercise. I will not dwell on the details as you may have been uh, exposed by uh, relevant uh, teachers in the school. What I would like to draw your attention to is uh, some of the people will criticize uh, community planning on a lot of grounds. The first one would be saying that, yes, so we have that, but nevertheless, don't forget about or the so-called dark side of it, uh, such as you know how uh, people have been using planning uh, to achieve some other means, and also 
some may criticize such attempts. Uh, basically, relate very much to market capitalism. You know, for the purpose of this talk, I would emphasize that you know there are a lot of differences, you know, among countries, and we would like to uh, hi highlight the Asian context. Of course, you know when we talk about people, I suppose uh, no one uh, would be unfamiliarized with the Nihal's work. No, I cannot replicate his work. What I would like to say is that you know his work tends to emphasize on from the perspective of people. We need to learn it from that side. Now, having said that. Uh, I also want to make a remark: is uh, uh, to talk about people. It's important for us to not to forget about what I call the spatial context of that. Otherwise, uh, we would uh, fall into the trap of what I call uh, spatial metaphors, which is to try to lateralize a lot of things without taking note of all the material process going on. Now, having made this to uh, very, very brief introduction on two concepts: people and planning. My next step is to show you some of the so-called specificities of Hong Kong, which make Hong Kong different from a lot other cities. Certainly, including Munsi. The first thing that we would should recognize that Hong Kong is uh, special in the sense uh, very different from other colonial cities as well because it's uh, in the intervening of the British colonialism and the Chinese traditional system. From that, we can see that you know uh, how these have really. A fact: the way Hong Kong had developed the, in the past 160 years uh, can be summarized by three characteristics. First, if we look at the urban literature, uh, we realize the argument that you know we need to understand urban development within global capital. Now, I would like to um, warn you that you know it's difficult. To pursue that particular revenue of exposure, uh, we, we look at Hong Kong because we should instead situate Hong Kong government at the center. Second, uh, because of arguments like you know, with Harvey, like others, you know, try to analyze the urban development within the way global capital. Have been moving around, so to speak, the switch of capital circuit. Nevertheless, that kind of argument well, would start off with saying that first of all, don't forget we have the industrial development, and then you know we would have the property development and the so-called the second the circuit. You know, the third circuit makes its way. Now, in the case of Hong Kong. This is not the case, because right before the colonial government was set up in 1842, land was already auctioned in the city. So, in a sense, then you know, right from the very beginning, you know, land development and redevelopment had been central to the whole city's uh, development. Third, I will highlight that you know why do we have Hong Kong as we have seen nowadays? It has very much related to way Hong Kong has been colonized over time. Here, we see that the pointer. No, okay. All right, so. When they started to colonize, to, 
they are compound but colonized in three stages, roughly. First of all, the, 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 the treaty in 1980, they seized Hong Kong uh, to the British, Hong Kong Island to the British, and then part of the Kowloon Peninsula, and then another treaty that seized the Kowloon Peninsula up to that street called Boundary Street, and then the third one uh, landed to the British, and nowadays we call the Liu Territories. Now, because of these stages of uh, colonization, the way the land relations and the way that have been restricted, thereby had restricted development within the two sides of the harbor. And that's why we have seen always uh, development, redevelopment over the places within the two sides of the harbor. Basically, the new territories uh, was uh, st started to develop in the 1970s. So it is because of that, the concentration of development on two sides of the harbor, thereby making Hong Kong this famous high density development. This is on the uh, example here. This is the one chai. Oh, thank you. This one, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is Wan Chai. Now, I think it's on, on this uh, introduction, then I can start to uh, look at what I have said, the three characteristics. The most important one is the Hong Kong government. Now, because of that, though I want to highlight within the Hong Kong government, the urban renewal, or renewal authority has played a very, very important role. Now, why did we have the urban renewal authority, URA, in the first place? It, it has to do with the way the so-called land leaseholdship that has been practiced in Hong Kong. In America, it will be freehold. We are talking about different leasehold, that means the government will lease the land to a developer for a certain period. And then after that, then the government would negotiate with the developer what it will be done. And because of that, we see all the so-called uh, contradictions that I mentioned. Now, starting in the 1980s, the Hong Kong government has discovered you know, the, some of the uh, limits of further development, then thereby setting the Land Development Corporation, LDC. And this has been the case uh, in other cities as well. And then in 1990, end of 1990s, uh, expanding the power of that uh, Land Development Corporation into URA. Now, how does that operation, the you know, URA operate? We have seen that you know, the Hong Kong government has a, you know, provided the URA lot of power to do things. First of all, to start off with, we have provided 10 billion Hong Kong dollars. And then we are talking about, you know, for the first five years, we have tax exemption. And you can see that in the whole process of development, it allows the URA to pay less in acquiring land. And so there is called waiver on land premium. Thereby, we can see that over the 33 projects, the URA has saved what, 15 or so million Hong Kong dollars. Another powerful mechanism the URA has is that you know, it has the land resumption ordinance. That is, if currently, if the developer can resume 70% of the property, then the URA can take it 
and go to the lands department and ask the land department the permission to resume the rest of the property, thereby making it easier to resume land. Now, having said that, we see that you know, the whole operation of URA has failed to go through uh, the ordinance that uh, was passed in, uh, at the end of 1990s to go through the whole process. Also, we can see that you know, the URA has to go through the uh, relevant, relevant government parties to get the so-called plan, uh, urban renewal, and then get the business plans and get all these uh, approved. So various steps have to go through. Another one is by the end of the 1990s, the Hong Kong government has initiated the so-called study called Urban Renewal Strategy Study. In that particular study, they identified that basically 225 projects across Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula. These are the sites that they, they should be uh, redeveloped. Mind you, the definition of being to be developed is that buildings are just over 50 years old. So you will be shocked in this, in, the, in this country, wherever you go, there will be buildings much older and then people still keep on it. But in Hong Kong, that will be considered you know, liable to redevelopment. Thereby, you can see that you know, a lot of redevelopment possibility. Yeah. Now, these are some of the statistics uh, saying that you know, how the URA has performed uh, in the last 10 years. Well, basically, we can see the, you know, the, the people this phase and the, the building the demolish and the profit and then the less asset of that just such a statutory organization. We are talking about $24 billion. Now, because of all these, what has been happening in Hong Kong uh, has been characterized by this uh, cartoon. Assuming this is the Hong Kong Island, and then uh, there was a tourist guy taking you around to see all the redevelopment. You know, within Hong Kong Island. This is one child. This is a project that I will talk about. So you can see that you know, basically starting the 2000, you know, redevelopment was everywhere in Hong Kong, not only in on Hong Kong Island but also in Kowloon Peninsula. Now let me start my uh, talk on the Little Street, which is uh, called um, Wedding Car Street as well. Now let us uh, you know, go uh, in this way. This is the aerial picture of the Little Street. We are talking about this uh, district. Uh, at the time when I took this picture, uh, that have been uh, demolished. Now this one was the picture taken uh, before demolition. You can see basically uh, the all this four, uh, five to six stories, and usually in the case of Hong Kong, on the top of the roof would be all these so-called illegal structures on the top, and these would be the buildings. Now basically all these uh, buildings are in general still sound structurally, still sound, but nevertheless, as the so called the urban renewal strategy identified this as one development site because these buildings were at that time over 50 years old. Now, this one here is the so, so to speak called H15. H to represent Hong Kong Island, 
and then the uh, 15 project of the Hong Kong. Now this would be the site of the project. The wedding card street would be this one along the street. Uh, so it will be nevertheless uh, to uh, accommodate the development, it uh, to try to uh, develop another, another building, uh, another part of the city, uh, uh, another uh, few blocks uh, next to it. And then the top of the buildings uh, just try to identify the Wan Chai district, and at that time, uh, so all the other activities around it. Now, give you some idea what this site is all about. We are talking about uh, around 9,000 square meter, to about 54 buildings, and then a factor of uh, households will be 930, and then this would be usually mixed classes. What it means is that in Hong Kong, usually on the ground would be retail commercial activities, and then usually it will be the case on the uh, second or third floor, even less, and then otherwise uh, it would be residential. In this area, because the neighborhood itself uh, started basically immediately after the 1940s. So in that sense, uh, the neighborhood itself has been accommodated by a lot of elderly. And in general, as I said, you know, although these buildings are 50 years old, they, uh, they were acceptable in terms of uh, living condition. <coughs> now this is basically show you the timeline of uh, uh, the death development. Uh, basically we start to see the building or the new buildings were erected in 2015 and then you will go back then we start to see the construction work started in 2010, and then the acquisition, and then basically we can see that starting a lot of uh, so-called resistance movement that Ni Hao talked about, uh, basically from 2001, 2003, and then you can see it until you know, 2007. Now, these few pictures show you what the wedding car street is all about nowadays. We can see that basically all this high rise residential block, and then you know, the whole building design pretended to be some kind of European, you know, with the bridge linking up two buildings. And then you can see that would be the other uh, angle to showing how these buildings uh, were, are linked up. And this would be on the ground uh, type thing. And this would be the street itself. It has been so-called pedestrianized. <coughs> Basically, this street has been, so to speak, eaten up in the whole uh, development. I would like to draw your attention to this um, uh, poster. This poster was uh, widely published in newspapers uh, in the early two, uh, 2006, early 2006. Uh, tried to advertise uh, this, uh, all the flats to be built, and then here, it, the asking, pie, asking price was uh, 18,000 per bid. And I want to draw your attention the price that was given to uh, affected households in January 2008, 2004, which is 4,000. <coughs> which is saying in a decade's time, uh, the price of it has been raised from 4,000 to 18,000. This is not yet the case. Here is the development we just talked about. And then 
uh, that's the Leichung Street or Verdun Car Street, and that would be the towers. And according to statistics corrected, collected, it will be basically uh, by the uh, to 2014 or 2016, you can see that basically the asking price for the flat would be as high as 30,000. <coughs> so you can see a big difference in the prices. In the whole process, the government has been uh, doing a lot to enhance development. How is it done? For example, in this particular here, it uh, shows that that would be the development, the street and the development, that would be extra block. And what has been do done is originally there was the street, and then that street, so to speak, was eaten up, thereby, you know, in terms of calculating the GPA, GPA GFA, we can, uh, you know, we increase the GFA much higher. And then that applied to, to uh, some other phases as well. And this one would be another street, uh, part of it has been cut off. One interesting thing about all these activities is the government, the lands department of the government would provide you know, a helping hand by reusing, reissuing a new lease for that. Originally, it would be you have building, you have one lease, you may have another lease, and now after eating up the street, the whole thing will be in one lease. And that's one lease. And then also the developer would be uh, required to pay only $1,000 for changing the, the, into the new lease. And thereby we can see that what is the situation. This was the uh, paper submitted to the Legislative Council, the highest <coughs> legislature in the, city, in the city of Hong Kong in 2018 uh, to June, it shows the statistics of the development of that project. It shows that, you know, basically the amount of money gained by this whole project is $88 billion. $88 billion. Now that's one side of it. <coughs> the other side is what I would like to tell you is that when the development was proposed, the URA had argued that you know, it would do a lot of things. And then uh, what I have done after you know, hearing that the asking price of the latest development and the, <coughs> the price that they gave to the Residents were so big, I start to look at what I call, you know, try to dig out the bro broken promises of the URA. <coughs> First of all, the URA said that since the whole street was originally occupied by stores <coughs> selling wedding cards, and thereby we, the URA said we are going to replicate <coughs> that kind of environment. So you can see that basically that was the picture, you know, before with all the activities going on and this was the so-called visual image of it and so to speak at the end this was the case. This is the case. So basically you are know, shopping street Why the street has disappeared, you know, everything gone. We also do, uh, did a survey of the shops within the area and then to reveal how many shops are still doing the business related to the wedding card because that was the promise by the developer, by the URA. We did a survey of the shops and identify that only 
three out of 70 cent shops already there had something related to wedding, but actually there is only one shop that still, so to speak, uh, sell wedding cards. <coughs> now, some of the shops are originally were you know, pr printing and then uh, selling wedding cards uh, have been promised to return, but many of them could not return uh, for the simple reason, because the shopping mall had his logic of organizing it. And <coughs> some shops which may have intended to return, nevertheless could not return because of this logic, because all these things that must be met, all kinds of requirements must be met before they can come. Besides, <coughs> the asking rent is much higher. <coughs> now, when the developer first started to develop the, the, the thing, they promised that they would provide a lot more open space in the area. As you can see, that this district was old, you know, started its development in the 18, 1850s or so. As a result, there have not been so-called sufficient public space, open space in the area. And the developer, when they try to persuade people uh, to hand down all their properties to the developer saying that they will provide more public space. Now, in fact, what is happening is the public space has been disappearing, disappearing. I show you that this one here, or the Amor Street, and then the, 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 the whole area was a park, a small park originally in there. But at the end of the redevelopment, what is it? Basically, I show you the picture of this here and this part here. This now have become reduced to passageways <coughs> that you know, people from other place and then go to the uh, property instead of the original park. <coughs> I said, when they start off, as in this vision, vision of the picture, it will be a green project, providing all the greens. And then, thereby, because of that, I can ask <coughs> the government to provide them more GFA. At the end, what is it? <coughs> At the end, is, you can see basically all this so-called public space, green space, nothing in store. If there is some green space in store, basically is on the podium. So we can see that basically these, uh, the, these are the public space. And you can see my two friends uh, try to stretch their legs uh, just to touch each other. Even more so. <coughs> these public space, you know, so to speak, so small, so they may be, are not allowed to be used by every single one because on the ground floor they put up a plaque restricting their usage. So that has been very common in Hong Kong project. Developers said that they would provide more public space and thereby they can claim the high GFA. At the end, all this public space have been privatized looks like they are only for the residents in that particular property development. Also, a promise <coughs> that, yes, uh, we will destroy the whole street of Wedding Car Street and all the things. What the developers said, oh, we will give you back <coughs> A theme park with the uh, wedding at the middle. So at the end, what is it? It's only one building which is 
so to speak, the grade two building, historic building, was retained. And we built it inside it, only this part, this tall, is used as a museum. Actually, in the museum, it's showing some of the photos, and that's it. Basically, nothing. Instead, we try to see, you know, it, the particular building has to install some of the public facilities, such as public toilets in area, in here. If we look at it, the, uh, <coughs> the URA has been advertising, propagandized that it is provide the so-called area-based renewal planning approach. It will <coughs> try to include people to talk about the project and then use so-called the 4 r rehabilitation preservation, revitalization. Actually, what has been happening is then basically the identified site for redevelopment, for uh, profit. So, now this is uh, my second part of it, to elaborate, to see how people uh, have been involved in this redevelopment. <coughs> We can see that basically what has been happening with all this resistance that uh, have characterized it, have made the Reading Car Street renowned in the world, is that in reality, what we have seen is, you know, there will be experts that call into the so-called resistance movement and with affected residents, and most of these uh, would be owner. So no tenants will was heavily involved. It has pursued activities like discussion, consultation, roadshows, exhibition, workshops, forums, home visits, survey, field excursions. Okay. So what has been done? Basically, it has taken into the, the issue of diversity. It will cover this, that, and, but, if you look at uh, the, all these activities, basically, the one way or other, still you know, benefit the developers. And also, at the same time, it followed the procedures. Now, let me show you uh, the type of you know, people's resistance uh, in the area. <coughs> so, for example, here, you can see there are a lot of activities being carried out uh, on site. For example, the resistance area, the resistance movement, they try to put up you know, banners uh, advertising uh, their improvement. This one here, another activity. So this is the whole you know, forums on the street. They went to the district council to tell the case and argue the case. They went on pet petition to the Legislative Council to stop the project, and then they come up with a technical exercise, uh, so what is called the bell drum proposal. Now all these have the limitation that I just took on. In particular, I want to focus on two issues. One is what, how the people has been you know, conceptualize and then pursue. So basically, what we have seen in terms of people, you know, they are talking about really generalized the concept called human rights, instead of you know more specific you know, issues, uh, care, interested you know, people. And then when they talk to you know relationships, it really. Uh, taken out of context and talk about the dark side. And basically, we can see, see that they talk, but nevertheless, they treat the status quo for granted. The second issue is about democratization. We can see that basically, the whole exercise of resistance, you know, basically detach 
planning from politics, you know, never challenge the underlying technical rationale, rationality. Uh, this have been done in Hong Kong, uh, alike with the, the whole low level of community organization and resistance. So what end up with? Using a very traditional Chinese way <coughs> of uh, showing the anger of it is to like carrying a funeral, you know, by one of the storekeeper, you know, in front of her store, you know, to say how you know the convolution between the business and the company uh, and the government in you know grabbing land and property from the people. <coughs> I think if you give me the time, I will shorten this and then uh, just to. As so we're something that you know, we, we were uh, at the invitation of the district board to carry out the future um, study of one child, and then we you know they did make some recommendations. We argue that if we were to build public housing in Leitong Street that would be a good starting point. There, we propose that we, uh, you know, instead of relying on government land, on private land, we propose something called community property. It is basically a collective mechanism that goes beyond private ownership, beyond government land, and then, you know, the community as some kind of development trust and then the citizens really hold the decision maker, making power, and the resource would come from everywhere, everywhere. And then you use funding based on land exchange, land development, and housing development. <coughs> okay, just to conclude, <coughs> what I'm trying to argue is that given Hong Kong's specificity, it's difficult for us to <coughs> just use a lot of concepts, you know, developed in the West. Uh, for example, uh, the most common concept would be to understand how or this uh, urban redevelopment as some kind of gentrification. And so, the wedding Gulf Street case illustrates more of the complexity than uh, simply the rhetoric of people um, planning. And if we really want to know more about redevelopment in case of Hong Kong and other things, we really need to study cities more meticulously in order to uh, decipher more perceptively. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. Basically, they have scattered. Uh, before uh, the development, redevelopment, some has you know, started their business in the vicinity. But the number has been very small. And a lot of them uh, has now closed their business once the owner uh, had uh, getting older. So I think that is some kind of usual feature you would observe in a lot of redevelopment uh, projects in, around the world. So uh, it's a sad story of it. Now regarding compensation, uh, it's uh, the URA has been handling it you know, very secretly. 
they will deal with each property owner personally, and you will not allow to announce the result of negotiation, your personal negotiation, to even your friends living of uh, having shop in their area. Otherwise, then you will violate, and then they will sue you. So as a result, that we will break down a lot of the so-called forces of uh, cooperation among a lot of uh, all these resistance movements that we have observed in other cities. I have need your two tongues. That focuses on historic preservation. Like you got a, got a preservation on your two tongues? Historic preservation. You are it? No, is there a historic preservation organization in, in Hong Kong? Um, yes, uh, we have some kind of organization uh, which try to classify a particular site, a particular building, a particular street, you know, according to history. Grade one, grade two, grade three. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you know, for example, for this particular case, it was uh, class, not classified as uh, something that were by protection, except that particular building, as I put it down, grade two, but <coughs> at the end, they have not done anything. So I think that's the, in a sense, that that's the tragedy of Hong Kong. Why? As I said, because land development and redevelopment has been so central to the whole Hong Kong economy and development. Uh, as a result, you know, people tend to relate it to that instead of historical preservation. So basically, a lot of historical buildings have gone in Hong Kong. It's a, it's a tragedy, but that is the fact. Now, I think the closest we can get is Singapore experience. Now, for example, in Taipei, not the case, because in Taipei, uh, we cannot see the uh, concentration and centralization of capital as in Hong Kong. Now, in Singapore's case, we know that right now, it's still 85% of the population lives in public housing. In Hong Kong, uh, in recent years, we had reduced from 50 something now to 45 only. So you're talking about the whole thing different. So in Singapore, they have 85% public housing. And there is a, as a result, the government uh, has an even stronger hold in doing things. So. Um, they have the, what, H-A-B, the Singapore, uh, H-U-B, yeah, it's very strong hope, you know, but, uh, so it's uh, slightly different. Um, Hong Kong, what I have been arguing, but I have not been elaborate, is the coalition between Hong Kong government, land developer, and all the things is, I would argue much more complicated because in Singapore, I think the the HUP is government. The uh, the the largest um, finance operation. Um, I know it in Chinese, uh, but <laughs> that that's the Singapore. That because the owner. The chief CEO, CEO is the uh, sister-in-law, uh, the, no, the daughter-in-law of Lee Kuan Yew. So the kind of relationship are more complicated than, than in the case of Hong Kong. I, in that sense, I'm not going to, going to say Hong Kong is unique. Nevertheless, 
because of the way it has developed over the 160 years, it has its historical roots, which, uh, which is very difficult, uh, with the very different from other cities in East Asia. A quickly related question. The Hong Kong government derives about 1% of its annual operating revenue from traveling there. It does not have that kind of uh, marking scheme, you can say it. Nevertheless, it has its intention to increase all the time. Because at one time, you know, you can know that. Uh, I think in the 1980s, I think 30% of public revenue came from land-related activities, like selling and then stamps, all this 30%. And now we are talking about the still 20%. So in that sense then, you know, it has been in the interest of the Hong Kong government to keep the so-called land and property development still going. We had the experience after the Asian financial crisis and the land SARS, it just dropped. So the next, the following, uh, we call chief executive, that means the mayor in the American system, just returned to the former rationale of doing things. Just rely on the land market and the land and property market and then the, the economy, so to speak, pick up again. And then we residents are in trouble because of the uh, rising land range and et cetera. <coughs> so, a question to you. Yep. Uh, what, did the, what did the people who assisted, I mean, people in the sense, not only just residents, but also organizations, I mean, people like yourself, who assisted this development, what, what, are the, what kind of lessons do you have uh, from this project? What kind of effort? Um, I think that's uh, very similar to others. Uh, I think. Uh, I think the only thing we can say is, you know, we have to stop believing in the rhetoric provided by the government, and then the we have to be reject being silent and then up against the hegemony. That's what we have to do, continuously do. And that's the experience that we have after the Umbera movement as well. I think that's what we can do. Now we know that we have lost a lot of battles, but we have lost, not, not yet lost the war. I think I will make a recommendation which uh, Niha would like, you know, go to the people. And, and then you work with the people. Nevertheless, you know, some of the uh, people, then we, when we start working with, <coughs> with uh, people like that, they had no idea about land de the development. For example, they even don't understand what is plot ratio. They even don't understand all this, for example, all the tricky things about, you know, that the, the developer can do, you know, tie all the properties into one piece and then get the lease and all the things. So in that sense then, the, the residents, the people need to be equipped, knowing what exactly and how they were, treat, uh, they were treated badly and how in that sense then at least they know all the land politics, then they would be able to come up with you know, better strategies. Learn by mistake one time, one time, and then go. So 
Okay, so thank you very much, Wenxing. Uh, thank you. Yeah.